Our New Testament lesson today comes from Mark chapter 12, verses 38 through 44. And I invite you to hear the word of the Lord. As he taught, Jesus said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and he watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thank be to God. And let us pray. Well, Father, as we read these verses and we hear your word proclaimed, we ask that you would touch and convict our hearts. Use this time, Lord. Use this time. Use this video. Touch all who are watching, all who are listening that they would be drawn close to you, they would desire to seek after you, and Lord, that they would know your love for them. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, because you, O oh God, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we start a new stage in our sermon series in the Gospel of Mark today, and so heads up, this is going to be a hard sermon. The risk of debt dragging you through familiar territory, let me remind you where we are in the Gospel of Mark. Mark introduced us to the life and the ministry of Jesus. Jesus began his ministry as a wandering preacher throughout the lands gaining in popularity and fame. He demonstrated remarkable power, the power of the Christ, the Messiah. He showed that he was stronger than sickness, evil spirits, nature, and even death. He claimed and then demonstrated the authority to declare the forgiveness of sins. He predicted his passion, that is, that he would enter Jerusalem, that he would be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. He would undergo great suffering. He would be killed, and then, after three days, rise again. And he did enter Jerusalem. He rode triumphantly into Jerusalem with shouts of praise on Palm Sunday, signs of the coming Messiah. And as we have seen in recent weeks, Mark has reported how Jesus prevailed in successive controversies thrown at him. He confounded the chief priests and the scribes, he confounded the Pharisees and the Herodians, and he confounded the Sadducees. And even after he demonstrated who he was, all of these authorities continued to reject him. And Jesus answered every question and every challenge to the extent that, at the end of our passage last week, Mark wrote, after that, no one dared to ask him any questions. All of which brings us to our text this morning. This new stage in which Jesus turns the table to judge the temple. He's judging the church. And that judgment was not complimentary. There are two episodes here, and I want to take them in order. First, beware the scribes. Jesus taught the disciples, beware the scribes. Jesus' criticism of the scribes 
was it the political equivalent of inciting rebellion against the temple authorities. It was functionally drain the swamp and defund the police at the same time. Scribes were a powerful part of the authority of, of, the authority of structure. They were the lawyers. They were called scribes because they were responsible for copying the scriptures, for knowing the scriptures, and for commenting on the scriptures. And Jesus targeted them because they were supposed to know the scriptures and the law, and yet they had failed or refused to recognize who he was. I mean, look at Jesus' list of criticisms. First, they like to walk around in long robes. I deliberately scheduled this during the summer so that I would not be wearing a long robe. <laughs> but the robes Jesus was describing were used as part of the priestly functions in worshiping God. They were, uh, there were and there are ceremonial uses for robes. I mean, robes signal holy time, distinct from common time. They were used as a physical symbol of the people presenting themselves before God. They were worn by the priests when engaged in priestly functions, that is, when they were ministering before the Lord. The scribes, on the other hand, had taken to wearing them around the temple complex in order to be noticed and in order to gain respect for themselves. Second, they like to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and at places of honor at banquets. I mean, the custom here is really similar to the system in the military, that those of a lower rank initiate a salute to those of a higher rank. Scribes expected to be greeted by those whom they deemed to be inferior. They sought to be worshipped rather than lead the people in worship. And third, and this is where Jesus moved into a more direct attack, they devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. This went directly to their integrity. It seems as if the scribes were acting like politicians in Washington who spend taxpayer money to run hearings that create a lot of noise, sound and fury signifying nothing. I mean, widows consulted the scribes on matters of the law, and the scribes were taking the widows' money and homes as payment. And then they would offer long, meaningless prayers in order to help those whom they had robbed to feel better. So what was Jesus saying? Jesus was saying the scribes were corrupt and the temple was corrupt. And let me be more specific. Though there may have been criminal corruption, it was more the reality that they had perverted and distorted the purpose of the church. They lost sight of what the church was and what it was supposed to do. In Jesus' judgment, the temple itself had become the chief object of worship, and all the effort was going into preserving the building and the system that they had established. The temple had forgotten God. It was being operated for the benefit of those who work in the temple. Their efforts were designed to protect the growth and the power of the temple. In short, in their rejection of Jesus, they demonstrated that they did not or would not recognize God. And whether it was because they weren't looking or because they didn't want to see, they didn't recognize the truth when he came to them. They had become corrupt. And unfortunately, corruption in the church has not gone away. There are two ways that it usually happens. 
the church becomes so heavenly minded that it's no earthly good or it becomes so earthly minded it's no heavenly good the church that's so heavenly minded is one in which becomes a haven for those who are fleeing from sinners rather than a refuge of those fleeing to God away from sin. Seeking purity, the church shuns those who are perceived to be impure. It becomes the job of the church to protect God from sinners, to prevent them from tarnishing what God has done. This is a church that's inwardly focused. And the inwardly focused church is an institutionalized church. The attention, the energy, and the processes are designed for those who are already in the club. Those who want to join need to get with the program and conform to the cultural expectations. The priorities include preserving the building preserving the programs regardless of outcome, and preserving, that is, preserving the people who are already there. Worship becomes a product evaluated for the way it makes me feel, rather than a time of offering to be pleasing in God's sight. Jesus' judgment on the scribes here is reminiscent of the Old Testament prophets criticizing empty rituals of the institutionalized church that the temple leaders had produced. In Malachi chapter 1, A son honors his father and servants their master. If then I am a father, where is the honor due me? And if I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests, who despise my name. You say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food on my altar. And you say, how have we polluted it? By thinking that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals to sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not wrong? Try presenting that to your governor. Will he be pleased with you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now, implore the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. The fault is yours. Will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that someone among you would shut the temple doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hands. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nations, and in every place incense is offered to my name, and a pure offering. For my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted, and the food for it may be despised. What a weariness this is! You say, and you sniff at me, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or is sick, and this you bring as your offering. Shall I, shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who is a male in the flock and vows to give it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is reverenced among the nations. See, the problem with the institutionalized church is that its service doesn't really, really believe that God is engaged in the midst of the day-to-day -day life anymore. It treats God as if things now are as they always have been and always will be. It's as if God is powerless to transform lives or to deal with sin after he's dealt with it, after he's saved us. Or worse, that God's not interested in his creation any longer. In other words, 
the institutionalized church needs to shut the door after we get in because God may not be strong enough or able to save us and others. But what was Jesus' message and ministry? God is strong enough. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The gospel, not church buildings, not church programs, not even the church's doctrine. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. Now, on the other hand, the church that's so earthly minded acts as though it has to do God's work for God. The church has to solve poverty, injustice, and any perceived wrongdoing. Prayer is necessary in that it lets God know what we're doing, but there's no expectation that God will actually do anything. This kind of a church assumes the responsibility of judging what is right. They don't trust God to do the work because God just doesn't seem to be doing it. At least, God's not doing it in a timely fashion. I mean, injustice indicates that God is absent and it's the church's job to step in on God's behalf. Now, the problem with the earthly focused church is that it perceives itself to be the strong arm of the kingdom of God. They have the right to fix the wrongs. They use power to speak truth to power with no awareness of the irony of their tactics. In this scenario, they have to do the work of affecting and judging social justice because God's absent, neglectful, uncaring, or irresponsible. Or worse, God doesn't really understand how things really are or how change really can happen. However, we remember Jesus' name, Emmanuel, which reminds us that God is with us. He's not absent. He's not neglectful. He's not uncaring, and he's not irresponsible. God shows how much he cares, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. And further, God's kingdom is not ushered in through the expression of human political power. Remember Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, and being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Friends, the church is not serving God when it succumbs to the temptation to judge, and it takes on a posture of righteous indignation. The church is not righteous by itself. It's righteous only, only insofar as it's rooted and connected to Christ. Both of these perversions of the purpose of the church and corruptions because they treat God as a concept and not as a God who acts. They don't serve the living God who reveals himself in Scripture. I mean, Jesus' judgment on the scribes. God is real. Beware. They are corrupt. Well, then, Jesus walked over to the treasury and sat down. And he observed what was going on. Imagine a courtyard in which there are 13 large trumpet-shaped containers used for collecting the financial offerings from the people. I mean, some were designated for specific purposes, designated giving. Others were free will offerings. And these offering places were open and public. 
Jesus took a position to watch as people approached to present their gifts. Well, large crowds had been gathering in Jerusalem for this Passover time, and the lines would have been long to make an offering. People from out of town saved up during the months away in order to make their offering while on their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Outside historical sources, Josephus in particular, noted that there was great wealth surrounding the temple. Jer Jerusalem was financially prospering, and many of those who lived and worked in the city were wealthy. Well, in the midst of the line comes a woman. Jesus identified her as a widow, perhaps by her clothing. She came and she dropped in two coins. Mark used the Greek word lepta. It would take a hundred lepta to make a denarius, that is, the equivalent of a day's wages. Jesus watched and then called the disciples to attention. His lesson to the disciples was startling. This woman, this widow, who was of little account within the temple system and culture, had given more than those who had given great sums of money. Now, I need to make one thing clear. Jesus did not condemn those who gave out of their abundance. He was comparing, and he was commending the woman, but he didn't condemn the other people who gave. The woman was commended because of her complete trust in the living God. We don't know her name. We don't know her background other than she was a widow. She doesn't speak here. We don't know if she interacted with anyone else while she was in the temple. She did not during this, she just did this one simple act that Jesus witnessed. All we know is that she put in her two coins. She held no security in her status, in her position, in her power, in wealth. She literally had nothing except her faith in God. Those charged with the responsibility of taking care of her, those, in fact, with the resources available, the resources in the temple available to them in order to take care of her, failed her. And despite their faithlessness, she remained faithful. That trust and that hope in God is worth more than any amount of money. As the advertisement goes, Making a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, so many dollars. Making an offering of so much money, so many dollars. Tro trusting and hoping in the living God for your salvation, priceless. So what do we take from this? Three quick things. First, God does not evaluate things with human eyes. In the eyes of the world, the temple was a huge success. Numbers are up, revenue's good, attendance is stable. They were able to keep up the buildings and make a nice living for those who worked in the system. The temple was a financial success. It was a religious success. It was a cultural success. On paper, the temple was a success. And yet in real life, Jesus spoke the word of judgment. The temple is a failure. Let me say it again. Despite their familiarity with Scripture, the law, the prophets, and the writings, they failed to recognize the living God standing right there in their presence. The indicators perceived, perceived as marks of success were actually just evidence of corruption. God does not evaluate things with human eyes. Second, God values our trust and our faith. In contrast to the corruption of the temple structure, this woman was remarkable and commendable because her conduct was valued by Jesus. She's remembered and celebrated because Jesus saw and celebrated what she did. Her audience for giving was God, not others. She put her trust in the power of the living God. 
the beginning of a, any Texas Hold'em uh, poker tournament, each player starts with the same number of chips. And at any point in the game, the player can put their tournament life at risk by betting everything. It's called going all in. And going all in means you're representing that you have the best hand and you deserve to win. Well, in whom or in what do you trust? If you had to make a decision to go all in, the situation you faced demanded you put all of your life, your trust, and your resources at risk, on whom or what would you place your trust? Now, if you respond God in answer to a time that when you had to go all in, in whom or what do you put your trust for day-to-day -day life? What does it look like to go all in? Well, let me point you to one of the missionary couples we support. Jeff and Abby Nelson, who are in Guatemala, who were here about this time last year. I want you to hear this from her note, her most recent note to supporters. We sit here in Guatemala, helpless, mostly, to do anything meaningful in the face of suffering around us. I'd love to share the stories of mercy and work done, but the truth is, other than food aid and some pitifully inadequate medical care, there's just not much we can do, and this is driving me nuts. Guatemala City registered over a thousand new COVID cases today, and we see the death counts flicker by 16 women here, 34 men there, Special mention being made where there's a toddler or an infant in the count. There was a story a few weeks ago about a teenage boy who died in the hospital and was buried before his mother had a chance to claim his body. The news today included a grim estimate of how little space is left in the cemetery in our community and another story about the astronomical number of hospital beds, 19,000, necessary to meet if the curve doesn't flatten out. It's high season for psychologists. And Jeff spends his days talking to people through their grief and angst, making interesting observations about how we are all just trying to make ourselves feel better in some small way. I roll over at dawn most mornings and check the news and social media, see people back home bickering about masks and breaking proverbial or actual dishes in sheer rage over the injustice and brokenness of the world. I see friends grieving, trying to act normal, trying to make sense of what is happening around us. I see the church occasionally speaking up and mostly bewildered about how to do and be something of substance in these choppy waters. What does it all mean? What does all this burning away of everything extra and many things of substance mean? Abby writes, I'd like to hope that we come out of this thing wiser, closer to our Creator, more in awe of the incandescent fragility of life, and full of love for our neighbor and for God Himself. Who are you at the end of the day when your sanity and continence are gone, when your job has fallen apart, when your mom is dying, when literally everything is hard and attempts at self-care are a joke, when your perfectly curated life turns out to be a whitewash that crumbles in the rain. Many of you reading this, that is, supporters to whom the letter was sent, don't know God. And sometimes I wonder if I really know God. But for those of us that do, let me just say that if there is a God and we are not Him, that what He thinks about us is the truest thing about us. Our identity and sense of self should be centered in our Creator, not our health, intelligence, sexuality, nationality, our roles, or any of the million sandy hills upon which we cast our security. And if we can manage to find ourselves in the face of a great, good God that loves us and made us in His image, we can find joy and true love for the people around us welling up out of that place of security and abundance. We are praying these things for you and for us, 
and for the strength to hang on to what is true in the face of so much struggle. The Nelsons are all in for God in Guatemala. Abby Nelson's given it, put everything in. Hers is a hope in God in and through the hardships and the realities of life. She's giving and giving all she has. Now this was the difference between the woman in the temple and all the others who had given out of their abundance. Their gifts were good. Hers was better. Hers was a witness of hope in the day-to-day -day goodness of God. God values our trust and our faith. And finally, third, God doesn't demand anything He's unwilling to give. Jesus commended the woman because she gave everything to God and trusted in God for her life. And this was exactly the road Jesus was walking. He had come to Jerusalem to be rejected. He had come to Jerusalem to suffer. He had come to Jerusalem to endure the judgment of sinful man, to bear the cost for sin in his own body, and to die, all while trusting in God for his life. In trust and obedience to God, Jesus put in everything for us. God doesn't demand anything from you he's unwilling to give. In fact, he doesn't demand anything from you that he has not already given. As so we come to a close this morning, I invite you to spend a few moments to reflect on your own life. What have you withheld in your heart from God? Have you withheld your trust from God? Have you withheld your hope from God? If you answer yes, I invite you to realize your own spiritual poverty and lay those things at the foot of the cross. Because friends, we all stand empty-handed at the foot of the cross. He has given all for us. And in response, we're to go out and share the gift that we've received. The gift is in this building. It's not in the programs. It's not in our criticism of the culture. The gift is the love of God we have received by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, she out of her poverty put in everything, all she had to live on. Brothers and sisters in Christ, hold back nothing. Go all in. Go all in for Jesus. Amen. 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 Friends, go all in for Jesus because he is all in for you. Know his great, deep love for you. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Rest, remain, and abide with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.